Let her rip. Anyone know this guy? <laughs> I was fortunate to learn early on that my active and continued involvement with civil rights would shape the rest of my life morally and politically and would alter forever my perspective on race, equality, justice, activism, and sacrifice. Some of you know I was a refugee, an immigrant to the United States. Nazi bombs fell on Antwerp the day before my third birthday. After a dangerous three-month journey, my parents, sister, and I were lucky to get on a ship in Portugal, sailed to New York City, and settled in the Bronx. That experience as a child helped to mold my life, making me always appreciative of the freedoms this country offers. It also awakened for me the connection between oppression of my people, European Jews, and my passion for opposing racism and the oppression of African Americans, including children. 30 years later, living in Houston, that message led this Jewish Bronx kid before a crucial election to take my kids with me to black Baptist churches where I spoke, encouraging parishioners to vote out the racist school board, ridding Houston of inferior schools for their children. They succeeded. Children volunteered to play important roles throughout the fight for civil rights. Before the Houston election victory, we began hearing of thousands of black Alabama children marching, joining in a crusade to desegregate restaurants, schools, bathrooms, and water fountains designated for whites or colored. Jump-starting a waning campaign, Dr. King and James Bevel began recruiting and training eager children and teenagers to continue the long, painful struggle to right the wrongs and end injustice. They began making an impact on progress towards desegregation, voting rights, and equality. Many adults feared lost jobs, but children had less to lose. Those children entered a whole new world of meetings, marches, violence, and prison. Dr. King hoped the action would, quote, subpoena the conscience of the nation to the judgment seat of morality. For many black children, the movement had already come alive. They had witnessed their parents' involvement in church. Parents were cautious about involving young people, but the brave actions of those children made lasting change in Birmingham at a key turning point in the movement. Both black and white children marched in direct response to their parents' activism and explicit encouragement, learning early about the downtrodden and concerned about their plight. Others had to sever family ties. One white girl joined up, realizing the hypocrisy of her segregated church. Kids of all ages were recruited and trained in nonviolent direct action. Thousands left schools and marched on Birmingham. Charles Avery walked 10 miles, leading 800 fellow students. Sheriff Bull Connor stopped, arrested, and jailed them, spitting in one kid's face. As Avery's group arrived, more than 3,000 young people were marching, leaving church in groups of 50. Connor turned attack dogs and fire hoses on the children. These pictures show the hatred of the police and townspeople and illustrate the sheer courage of the young participants. Jessie, 16, was soaked when she was loaded into a paddy wagon. I was told not to participate, but I was tired of the injustice. Why couldn't I drink out of the same water fountain as other kids? When I got older, I understood it was because my skin was black. So she marched. It didn't take long before the Birmingham jails became so overcrowded that students, all students arrested downtown were jailed at the local fairground. Jesse remembers that they slept on cots and sang freedom songs together while waiting for the movement leaders to raise the money for their bail. Gwen, 15, just released from jail, was determined not to go back. She'd been arrested for participating in a lunch counter sit-in and jailed for five days. We were in jail surrounded by people who had actually broken the law. It was scary. They were not nice. Gwen and her sisters trained to recruit children for the marches. On marching day, they went to the schools, cued students to leave, and went to the church, joined there by older kids. Many left with picket signs, walking shoes, and raincoats, knowing they'd be soaked by the sheriff's fire hoses. Freeman, age 12, 
marched and was arrested. He was confronted by Connor, who picked him up, spit in his face, and arrested him with many other youngsters. He said years later, we did this not just for ourselves, but for some higher purpose, one focused on civil rights for all Americans. Another 12-year-old heard of a march to integrate schools, dreamed of competing with whites. He marched, was jailed, and heard Dr. King say, what you do now will impact children yet unborn. 50 years later, he said, I didn't understand, but I knew it was powerful. As children kept marching, police kept attacking and jailing them. Pictures of their facing fire hoses and vicious dogs showed up on the front pages of the world's newspapers. It turned public opinion and that of President Kennedy in support of the movement's fight for justice and equality. Birmingham negotiated a truce with Dr. King and fired Connor. No more dogs. The courage and determination of Birmingham's children had worked, empowering the movement for justice and equality, creating possibilities for a more just world for following generations. History shows the children's crusade to be a pivotal event of the civil rights movement. It changed public opinion, opened the eyes of the nation and the world through courageous activism of its youngest citizens using nonviolent protest to provoke Birmingham into agreeing to desegregate. Thank you.